Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. It has felt like forever uh, since we have been together here. Um, and indeed, it's been quite a long time. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me and coming back after a three-week gap here. Um, uh, May was a, a super busy travel month and into the beginning of June there. Uh, and then last week had a bunch of medical stuff going on with my family, including, by the way, uh, uh, me. So I broke my hand, well, my finger, um, before, right before Mythmoot, actually, uh, and uh, I went through all of Mythmoot with a broken finger, it turns out. Um, and so now I have this ludicrous cast uh, on my on my hand. Um, to keep my uh, finger immobilized. So if you see this like weird thing, like if I'm, I, I may in the course of gesticulating flash my cast around, I didn't want anyone to be alarmed. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so it's all good. It's all good. Um, all right. Except typing. Typing is not good. Uh, this makes typing extremely difficult. So I've been doing a lot, uh, having a lot of fun with dictation software uh, over the course of this week. Um, <laughs> JJ asks if there's a, a cosmetic cast I can get for Narnian. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I personally, I don't mind Narnian not sharing that particular, um, uh, that particular, uh, 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 uh d difficulty with me here. Um, but, uh, all right. So, okay. So, uh, we are getting back to chapter five. So remember Fellowship of the Ring, right? Chapter five. That's where we were. We had just arrived, uh, at Crick Hollow. And uh, 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 and that's where we're going to pick up again today really quickly. Um, uh, one quick announcement. Um, it is now June. We are less than a month away from the beginning of our Hobbit Immersion Camps, our first ever children's Tolkien summer program. Um, and uh, in case you don't know about that or haven't heard about that, go to signumuniversity.org. Uh, scroll down just a little bit and you'll see our events uh, uh, uh our events tiles. You can click on our events pages, uh, and you can see the, the uh, yellow sign for the Hobbit Immersion Camp. The Hobbit Immersion Camp has uh, has really picked up. Um, the way it works is that we have a, 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 a one hour online session every day uh, for two weeks. You know that uh, the, during the weekdays, right? The 10, 10 sessions, one hour a day, one p.m. Eastern time. And uh, and those are large group sessions for everybody who's uh, who's signed up. Uh, and it's hundreds of people who are going to be participating now, which is super exciting. Um, and so everybody can be involved in sort of the large group discussions as we work our way through two chapters a day. Um, and then at the end, or not at the end, um, then uh, people are going to sort of gather together at local chapters uh, so that kids can get together and, and uh, do activities and games and crafts and stuff together uh, to really kind of immerse themselves imaginatively in Tolkien's world. Uh, it should be really cool. And we have now over, we have what, 63 chapters uh, across America and Canada signed up uh, right now. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been, it's been really awesome. I've been really, uh, uh, really having a great time watching those pop up. We're putting together a web page, uh, which will be able to show a map with all of the chapters uh, around North America uh, that are gonna be participating. So uh, if you, if there's one near you, uh, or you know, if you would like to sign up a group, there's still time. Um, the, a bunch of homeschool groups and sort of local family clusters and stuff that have signed up as well as public libraries uh, with whom we've been working a lot. So um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be awesome. I'm expecting somewhere around, you know, I'm not sure exactly how many kids, uh, as the, of course the groups are having a hard time predicting, of course, exactly how many kids from the community are going to come. Um, but we could have anywhere from like 300 to 800 kids or so, uh, at the Hobbit camps this summer. So it's going to be really, really neat. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> everybody's teasing me about my hand. Uh, 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 well, Nick, I was always mightier with my, with my right hand than I was with my left hand. So that's not saying all that much. And, uh, and, uh, 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 uh King of the North, I, um, uh, I didn't break it between, uh, that Mythmoot and now it was broken the whole time at Mythmoot. Uh, my finger was broken, turns out, um, uh, so I only just finally got an x-ray after I got home. It's all good. Um, all right. So 
so and anyway, Hobbit Camps. I'm super excited about this, and uh, I am just I am delighted to be facilitating uh, Tolkien a Tolkien program for kids. Uh, and I call it Hobbit Immersion Camp. Um, first of all, because it's a little bit funny, um, but also just because that's really kind of how I've always pictured this to be. You know, a two week camp where people really just you know where the kids can just submerge themselves in Tolkien's world and really uh, you know have that come alive for them. Uh, as they read through the book and uh, uh, and really begin to sort of think about and notice things that they haven't noticed before and thought about before. Uh, so I'm really excited and I'm really excited to see how we can uh, follow up uh, on that. Next, we already have, you know, the response to this has been so strong, uh, especially in this last uh, like two, three weeks uh, that we're, uh, you know, we're now already thinking about uh, plans for next year and how we follow this up and the kinds of the things we do next. So, um Anyway, yeah, that's the um, that's the plan, and uh, so I just wanted to make sure you guys were all aware of that. As I said, still time to sign groups up, uh, and uh, uh, and if there's one near you, by all means, uh, take advantage of it. So, okay, uh, um, let's uh, move on to class. As uh, for some reason, I was late today. Um, <laughs> Tony Mead says next year we need to have a Hobbit infenestration camp. Um, well, I don't know, Tony, but if um, um, if if uh, if we do a Fellowship of the Ring camp, uh, we could totally have uh, you know an activity where people practice yanking people in through windows by their hair. Um, that may or may not go over real well, but it would be a fun activity, right? Um, uh, but anyway, okay. Um, so let's um, uh, let's uh, let's let's. Let's get back to our discussion. So tonight's class is called Comprehension Levels. We're going to be going through the Conspiracy Unmasked section of the Conspiracy Unmasked chapter. Um, the time after dinner uh, when, well, we're going to get to there. We still have the bath song to do. But if we get through the bath song, then we're going to get to the time after dinner when the conspiracy is being revealed. And I'm really interested, as I was going through this chapter again today uh, in the last couple days, I've um, I was just, I've been really interested with the way that uh, that Tolkien reveals things and kind of the the, the different levels of understanding and realization that uh, that that we had that sort of described in the other Hobbits that Frodo has that we have as readers. Uh, so I want to be kind of looking at that um, at that together. So all right, um, so that's what we're gonna do tonight. My hope, my 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 probably vain uh, uh, ambitious aspiration is to get all the way to the next song as well at least up to it if we don't actually get to talk about it uh, that is the uh, uh, the the song that uh, Mary and Pippin uh, and I think Sam sing um, the one that's modeled on the dwarf song uh, the uh, we must away our break of day song so we'll see we'll see if we can get as far as that um, all right so let's, uh, I know, Tarlonio, it's it, not only just like to do the two songs, right? But there's quite a bit of text in between those two. So, so it's only about four or five pages. It's conceivable, but we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see how we do. So, but first, as always, uh, a couple comments and questions uh, from the discussion board. Uh, 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 frequent poster Lincoln Alpern says I've been listening to the recording of the last Exploring the Lord of the Rings episode from three months ago I mean three weeks ago in which Gandalf's decision to appoint Sam as Frodo's companion on the journey was discussed during the discussion I bring up Gandalf's assertion that this will punish Sam and punish you properly for listening and characterizes this I characterize this as a bit of facetiousness on Gandalf's part because of course he knows it's not really a punishment at all Except kind of it is. Even though Gandalf doesn't know everything in store for Sam on the quest with Frodo, he can surely guess that it will involve some amount of danger, hardship, and sorrow. Sure, it's overall a great gift to Sam, but as gifts go, it ain't exactly an all-expenses-paid vacation in the Bahamas. In fact, I can't help but be put in mind of Tolkien's assertion in regards to the theological, to the theological implications of human mortality being characterized as a gift in his legendarium that all of God's punishments are also gifts. We might deduce that Gandalf operates under a similar logic. Okay. Lincoln, uh, as always, really glad uh, you brought this up. Uh, uh, your questions are always very thoughtful. Um, and 
On the one hand, I stand by what I said. I think that Gandalf is joking and being facetious when he says that he's going to punish him properly for listening. Um, on the one level, I do think he's just kind of having, you know, he's sort of giving Sam a hard time, right? Like he knows that Sam, he clearly believes that Sam wasn't doing anything wicked, right? That really deserves very serious punishment. Um, and he's certainly not like being like, I condemn you to this and banish you forthwith from the Shire, right? That's not obviously what's going on there. Um, and when he says, you know, I'm going to punish you properly for listening, um, there seems to be that... the. Uh, that seems to partake of the kind of jocularity of tone and giving each other a hard time that we see among the hobbits in between Gandalf and the hobbits in that sort of characteristically uh, uh, sort of English way uh, that we can so often see. I still think that that's true. But, Lincoln, I'm glad that you brought this up because you're right. There's also more to it than that, right? Um, it's, um, it's, it's... I don't think that Gandalf really means it as a punishment. But of course, Lincoln, you're entirely right that it also kind of is a punishment, right? Um, what I was reminded um, of was the scene at the end, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, the passage that I would re be really interested to compare this with, um, that is Gandalf and his punishment of Sam, uh, is with Aragorn and his punishment of Baragond in The Return of the King. Right. Um, Aragorn mixes mercy and justice. Right. He punishes Baragond for breaking the law. Um, he punishes him by banishing him from the city. But of course, his punishment isn't really a punishment. It is a punishment. Right. He's banished. Um, but it's um, but it's really a reward as well, right? So it must be, uh, for he is appointing him the captain of the guard of Faramir, and Faramir is going off to live in Athelion, so he has to go too, right? Um, and the way in which, you know, punishment is combined with blessing there from Aragorn, it's not the same situation, right? That, of course, is, is an explicitly, um, an explicitly judicial situation, right? Um, where Aragorn is rightfully, lawfully, sitting in judgment uh, over Baragond. Um, and this is not anything like that, right? Gandalf is not in that kind of judicial situation. But the similarity of this combination, right, this combination of severity and kindness, this combination of justice and mercy, because, of course, there is a sense, right? I mean, Sam has done something wrong, right? He's been caught spying on his master. That's kind of a big deal, potentially kind of a big deal, right? Um, and as a result, he's banished, right? He's banished from the Shire and sent off on this horrible, you know, uh, uh, dangerous quest. That's true. But of course, it's not just severity. It's also kindness. Um, so th that's the, the connection that it seems to me. So I, again, here, I think Gandalf is joking, but in the context, there is a greater weight to it, right? Um, and I think that to a, to an extent, Gandalf even intends that double meaning, right? He's being lighthearted, and I think he intends it to be lighthearted, but at the same time, he... Uh, he I think that the... Um, the serious overtones? That's not exactly the right way to say it, but um, but hope you know what I mean. Uh, the serious overtones of it, right? You know, like, I'm going to joke about it, but the joke is kind of half serious, right? Um, it's like a punishment, anyway. It may not be a punishment, but it's like a punishment uh, to send him, even if he doesn't feel it to be a punishment, even if his response is to say, hooray, right? He bur still bursts into tears, right? Um, now, I think his tears are tears of joy, but see there again, Sam's tears at the end of the chapter, right? Are they tears of joy or are they tears of sorrow? Both, I think, right? Um, he's just said hooray, right? And he's going to see elves, sir, right? But at the same time, he's never been away from home. Um, and he's leaving his home and his, you know, his, his gaffer behind and going to he knows not what and, and coming back he knows not if, right? And of course, we learn later on uh, that he's got a best girl down the road, uh, right, who is rather waiting for a proposal which he's now going to have to hold off on, right? So Sam has some stuff to lose, and I think that his tears might not purely 
be tears of joy. And again, I think that Gandalf's words, that the particular angle that he takes in speaking jokingly with Sam um, has a, a double meaning for a purpose, I think, and, and, and it deliberately has, uh, has that echo. Amethorn suggests the gravity of the situation. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, Irendis points out that the answer with Tolkien always seems to be both. Uh, yeah, uh, often, definitely. I mean, it's uh, rarely, I think, that you'd be like, oh, no, he only means this, that other thing. No, it's totally out there. Um yeah, yeah. Uh, Crystal, I also think that Sam is crying happy. I do. But I, it's a complicated moment, right? Um, complicated in the sense that, I mean, rem- on the one hand, all of his dreams have just come true, right? Remember, of course, I'm unconsciously echoing Sam's own words from later on, right? And all my wishes come true, right? And he bursts into tears then. Um, his wishes about... Uh, Remember how he talked about how he believed those stories, right? Um, he believed Mr. Bilbo's story. He believes about elves and dragons and all those things, whatever Sandyman may say. Uh, whatever Ted Sandyman may say. Old Sandyman probably doesn't talk to him about it. Um, so on the one hand, like, those things are real. You're going to go off and you're going to get to see them yourself and you're going to get to, to, to go see elves and all those things and, and, and have adventures. That's... That's a fulfillment of a lifetime dream for Sam. But some dreams, when they're fulfilled, it's, there's, it's not unqualified by, by sorrow, by danger, by pain, um, by suffering, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nick Palazzo is warning people not to go to, me, to Professor Olson for counsel, for he will say both no and yes. So true. So true. Um yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good. Okay. And but anyway, I wanted to get back, Lincoln, to your final point there, which I think is, uh, which I think is a great one um, about the the gift thing there. Um, that's a uh, uh, I, I always thought a brilliant answer by Tolkien. Uh, just to kind of fill that in a little bit, it's in one of his letters um, where the, if I recall correctly, it's from one of the letters that he gets from a priest. Um, at least from a Catholic. I can't remember exactly which letter it is. Um, but of course, it's one, It's the one place in which you can say Middle-earth and Middle-earth theology is generally entirely compatible with Catholic theology. There are very few real discrepancies between them. But there's one thing which really does sound like a discrepancy, and that is um, the whole gift thing, right? The, um, uh, the, the, the death as a gift, right? Uh, I mean, according to, 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 to the Western church, according to Catholic theology, death is a punishment, is a consequence of sin, right? So it's not a gift from a Luvatar that men are designed with, right? Uh, it's a, it's, it's a punishment or a consequence of sin. And this is what that letter writer was calling him on and being like, "Mm, I don't really know. You know, it doesn't really seem to work. And Tolkien's like, yes, it was a punishment, but what of God's punishments, but which of God's punishments is not also a gift? And I was, I've always really, really loved that answer. Um, And uh, uh, anyway, so, so Lincoln, I think that's a really neat connection that you make there that, you know, Gandalf operates under a similar logic. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, you know, it's both no and yes, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, good. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's see. So Kuria asks, does death as a gift show up much in The Lord of the Rings, or is it more of a Silmarillion thing? trying to remember if there are any explicit references to the gift of men in the summer or in the in the Lord of the Rings well there must have there I'm, I'm to give back the gift 
it's Aragorn talking about his life at the end. Um, yeah, the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, uh, Tom, that's exactly what I was coming back to as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, the discussion between Arwen and Aragorn there at the end is the only place that I can think of, too, where it explicitly, where that word is used. Gift of death. But it has to be, right? Because he received that letter from somebody who had just read The Lord of the Rings, so they got that from The Lord of the Rings somewhere. Uh, so it's got to be in there. But yeah, and I think that's it must be the appendix. I can't remember any time in the main text when that language is used. But maybe I'm forgetting one. Um, anyway. Uh, okay. Next one is short. Uh, Mike, I loved this point about the uh, gift basket of mushrooms. Um, he says, This time through, I can't help but be reminded of the last time we saw a hobbit giving out extremely personal and relevant gifts. What if the basket had been accompanied by the following note? For young Master F. Baggins, given freely for his very own. Uh, that's a wonderful point, Mike. I love the parallel uh, there. And the idea that the gift of the basket of mushrooms partakes at least a little bit of the spirit of some of Bilbo's gifts, right? Um, uh, you know, that he left behind in Bag End. I think that that's really neat. Uh, I, I really I really like that. I mean, of course, it's... Uh, the difference between uh, Mrs. Maggot's gifts with her compliments and uh, Bilbo's gifts is that the, the gift of... Mrs. Maggot is sort of explicitly an act of forgiveness, right? Uh, Frodo had been guilty of thieving mushrooms before, and, uh, you know, that, uh, that she would put that up for Mr. Baggins with her compliments, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, gift him with this basket of mushrooms, uh, really just sort of emphasizes and shows that, you know, he is forgiven and, uh, and all is well. So there isn't that, that kind of spin to it, I guess I would say, uh, in, um, uh, in Bilbo's gifts, but I really, I, I really like that parallel, Mike, and I think that there, there certainly is uh, some of that same kind of uh, 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 sort of teasing spirit in the uh, the maggot's gift, uh, which I think, I think works really well. So I thought that was that was a neat connection. All right, um, let us jump into the text then. This is the arrival in Crick Hollow, which is, of course, the server that we're on here tonight, which is kind of fun. So uh, uh, here we are in Crick Hollow server, and uh, and and uh, look, and we're going to spend our whole class time in the house at Crick Hollow. Um, uh, well, what do you think of it? Asked Mary, coming up the passage. We have done our best in a short time to make it look like home. After all, Fatty and I only got here with the last cartload yesterday. Frodo looked round. It did look like home. Many of his own favorite things, or Bilbo's things, they reminded him sharply of him in their new setting, were arranged as nearly as possible as they had been at Bag End. It was a pleasant, comfortable, welcoming place, and he found himself wishing that he was really coming here to settle down in quiet retirement. It seemed unfair to have put his friends to all this trouble, and he wondered again how he was going to break the news to them that he must leave them so soon, indeed at once. Yet that would have to be done that very night, before they all went to bed. It's delightful, he said with an effort. I hardly feel that I have moved at all. Um, notice the emphasis here, right? The emphasis here is, you know, we get the immediate juxtaposition between the Crick Hollow house and Bag End. Um, uh, and the first thing that's emphasize is the similarity to home, right? Mary and Fatty Bulger have tried to make this as much like home, have tried to make it as much like Bag End as they could. And Frodo is struck by their success, right? He can see that they've arranged all of his furniture and things as nearly as they could uh, to the way they had been at Bag End, right? So we have, they've, they've attempted to reconstruct, at least to some extent, Bag End in this new place. And he finds it pleasant, comfortable and welcoming. Um, uh, but of course, we also have the, the differences, right? This 
this isn't Bag End and the emphasis on Bilbo's things, right? How he's reminded of Bilbo, seeing Bilbo's stuff, right? The stuff that he inherited from Bilbo in its new setting, right? Um, those things which had always been associated with Bilbo and with Bag End, seeing them outside of Bag End makes him remember Bilbo all the more, right? Um, and I think it's, of course, interesting that we start this scene with this kind of memory of Bilbo, right? Uh, uh, Frodo being reminded so sharply of Bilbo uh, because we're going to be getting up towards... There's a deliberate parallel to Bilbo's setting off here, right? Um, we're ending, of course, as we're going to do with the dwarfs or the parallel to the dwarf song uh, and the... Uh, uh, and the the and and the recollection again, at that point, you know, when we get to that song, of Bilbo uh, departing again from home. So we have this, the absence, um, the absence of Bilbo, right, being remembered, um, and the fact that Bag End is Bag End is gone. I mean, one of the things that I think is is really interesting about this is. Selling Bag End is a really big deal, right? I mean, Bag End was was really sort of the center of the Baggins family in a sense. Um, but he had, you know, he he sold it, he gave it away. Now, like the Sackville Bagginses have it, and uh, uh, that was a sacrifice that he made. The selling of the house isn't discussed as a huge sacrifice. You know, not a whole lot of uh, time is spent on that. Um, but you can see when we're coming back to it again um, in The Return of the King, we can see B Bag End really does mean a lot, right? Um, and we're reminded of that here. He's going after Bilbo. Yeah, but he sold Bilbo's house, right? Um, that was kind of a big deal. And yet, looking around, he's not just shocked, right? He's not just shocked and appalled. Uh, he's not just missing Bag End. He likes Crick Hollow. Um, and what does he like about it? Um, it seemed unfair to have put his friends to all this trouble, and he wondered again how he was going to break the news to them that he must leave them so soon, indeed at once, right? Um, what he seems to like about it most of all, I mean, yes, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's what? Pleasant, comfortable, and welcoming, right? But why is it pleasant, comforting, comfortable, and welcoming? Because his friends have made it so, right? It is the love and attention of his friends, the care that he can see that they made, not just to bring all of his stuff here, right? Not just to, uh, like, unpack for him and set up his new house for him, um, but to go so far out of their way to make his house as comfortable for him as he could be, right? To recognize, gosh, it must have been hard to sell Bag End. We'll try to make this as much like Bag End as we possibly can. That's clearly what I think touches him most. Um, and uh, it seems unfair to him to have... Uh, uh, put this to um, uh, to put to put his friends to to all this trouble. It's delightful. I hardly feel that I have moved at all, which sort of is untrue, right? Untrue in a couple different senses. Um, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Oakwig suggests maybe Frodo feels like he's hardly moved at all along his journey from Bag End to Neo Bag End. Well, Oakwig, in a sense, that's true, right? Um, leaving the Shire is what he's doing. Um, because remember, when it comes to his journey, he doesn't have a destination, right? Um, remember what he said in chapter two, Bilbo went to find a treasure, right? He's going to lose one and not return as far as he can tell. Um, Frodo thinks of himself as merely going off into exile, not, um, not going on a particular quest to a particular place. Um, so... Uh, the big thing is leaving the Shire. And we saw that at the beginning of chapter 3, right? Him saying goodbye, you know, shall I ever look down into that valley again, I wonder, and all that kind of thing. Um, as he's saying goodbye to the Shire as he's passing through. But at the end of the day, it's not really the Shire itself. That's the big deal to say goodbye to. It's his friends, right? Right. And that is what this chapter is centrally about. That is what is entirely on Frodo's mind uh, as he settles in, you know, briefly for the night uh, to the new house here in Crick Hollow. So in that sense, Oakwig, it's certainly true that he's hardly moved a, 
uh, along on his journey at all. He's he's traveled for several days. He has technically left the Shire already, but he's not really done the leaving yet, right? The leaving is still all before him. And the leaving, that's it. That's his whole quest, right? His whole quest is to leave the Shire behind and to go off into exile. Um, so yes, it's like now it's time to do that. And that's what he seems to be most, uh, most consciously aware of. Um, and yeah, uh, King of the North, I agree. Um, it is interesting that his friends went to this effort knowing that Frodo was leaving. Um, and, you know, he points out that's care because this effort was done for a night or two before Frodo leaves to make Frodo feel at home for as long as possible. Um, yes, yes, that they did all this knowing full well that Frodo did not intend to stay. Um, uh, is uh, is definitely, uh, I think, I, I agree with you, a very great token uh, of their of their friendship. All right, let's look at the bath song. We're told that this is uh, uh, one of Bilbo's favorite bath songs. I love the idea of the genre of bath songs. I wish I knew more of the genre of bath songs. Um, I'm still reminded of the comment when we were um, discussing the bath song, the original bath song in The Return of the Shadow. So when we were studying The Return of the Shadow in the original manuscript drafts of The Fellowship of the Ring, um, in the original bath song, uh, they're singing... The bath song comes in not at the moment of fulfillment, right? When they're in the bath. It comes when they're still on the road and desiring their bath. They're thinking about the bath that awaits them at the end of their journey. And that's when they sing the bath song. And uh, I, I can't remember who it was. I should go back and see who this was, who made this comment. But um, uh, somebody in the class was saying that, you know, the, the elves have sea longing, right? Hobbits have bath longing. Uh, and that just seemed to me uh, so right, you know, just seemed to me so right, uh, that idea of the bath longing of hobbits. And so, of course, they would, there would, it would be a genre, right? Of course, there would be many bath songs, and Bilbo would have favorites uh, from, uh, from among them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's look at, uh, let's look at the song, because this is, you know, uh, standing out in the genre, so we gotta, we gotta, we got to see that. Okay. Sing hey for the bath at close of day that washes the weary mud away. A loon is he that will not sing. O water hot is a noble thing. O sweet is the sound of falling rain and the brook that leaps from hill to plain. But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. O water cold, we may pour it need down a thirsty throat and be glad indeed. But better is beer if drink we lack, and water hot poured down the back. O water is fair that leaps on high in a fountain white beneath the sky. But never did fountain sound so sweet as splashing hot water with my feet. All right. Uh, so what do you notice here? What do you notice about the poem? As we've been going through, we've been spending time on the poetry, of course. First of all, you'll recognize the meter, right? This will be, uh, uh, this song is is no surprise when it comes to that, right? Exactly, Crooked Heart. We're in iambic tetrameter again, which is what we should have come to expect by now, right? This is Hobbit meter. Every, almost every, uh, no, without exception so far, every Hobbit song we've seen. Uh, and even Elf song magically translated uh, in the minds of hobbits, has been in iambic tetrameter, and the rhyme the rhyme scheme really simple, right? Um, just couplets. It's in quad. It's arranged in quatrains of two couplets each. A A B B A A B B. Right. Um, so that's so the 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 verse is really simple. The verse structure is really simple. Um, the Yes, Oakwig, I too find the capitalizations interesting, right? Um, some of it is simply like uh, here, right? Sweet is the sound. Um, this is just because O is an exclamation that stands on its own, right? So sweet is the beginning of the sentence. Um, but, uh, but water cold, water hot, beer, right? <laughs> get, get capitalized. Uh, it's mostly hot water that gets capitalized. 
uh, except for beer. Beer is the only other thing. Um, water cold, notice, doesn't get capitalized, right? The water that you drink doesn't get it doesn't get a capitalization. Water is capitalized again just because it happens to be at the beginning of the sentence, like sweet or sing, right? Um, but uh, hot water or water hot gets its capitalization. And again, and beer, of course. Um, and this certainly um, this certainly does emphasize a certain hierarchy here, right? Water hot is uh, is uh, presented as it were the sort of supreme form of water, right? Um, okay. More. What else do you notice? What else do you notice? What about the stanza structure? When we get the four stanzas like this, right? We get four distinct verses. Uh, what kinds of things do you know? First of all, um, uh, who's, who's the audience of the song? If the singer of the song, if the speaker of the song is the bather, right? Or the would-be bather, right? Uh, he who longs for the bath. Um, who's the audience? Um, notice how it starts. Sing hey for the bath at close of day that washes the weary mud away. Sing hey. So it starts with an imperative, right? It's a command. Sing hey for the bath at close of day. So this is a this is an instruction, right? We're meant to do we the hearers of the song are meant to do this. We're being addressed at the beginning of this. There's um there's a communal element to it right away. This is not a solitary voice saying, "Oh, I love my bath," right? Or, this is my personal opinion. No, this is a communal thing, right? Hey, you, sing hey for the bath at close of day, right? We are being enjoined ourselves to join in the singing, right? Um, and I think then the O's are what we're supposed to be singing. O oh, water hot, O oh, sweet is the sound, O oh, water cold we may pour, O oh, water is fair. Um... Uh, that um, that generally O's like that sort of suggest um, a, a form of direct address too, um, but I think it's it's meant to be again like we're we're, we're introduced to the song we're we're in the first stanza we're instructed to join into the song right and in the final line of that stanza we kind of uh, bring it out right. Uh, sing hey for the bath at close of day that washes the weary mud away. A loon is he that will not sing. So join with me, everybody. Oh, water hot is a noble thing. In a sense, that fourth line of the stanza is the first line of the, the first real line of the song, right? We start with those first two lines. Okay, people, here's what we're going to do, right? We need to sing about the bath because it's awesome, right? It washes the weary mud away, right? Um, anybody who won't sing is a loon, Right. So pipe in, join in everybody. Right. Yes. Non-singer shaming. I rend us. That's exactly what's going on there. Right. Um, and then we join in with oh, water hot is a noble thing. And then we have the three more O's. Right. So that first that first line, last line in the stanza. Right. Would seem to set the tone of the entire thing. Right. It's like uh, here's the thesis. Right. The thesis of the song is water hot is a noble thing. So that means we can expect the, the final three stanzas to what to illustrate the nobility of hot water to uh, justify or explicate the nobility of hot water, I suppose. Well, look at what happens. Um, so what's the subject of the first sort of content stanza, right? Stanza two. Oh, sweet is the sound of falling rain and the brook that leaps from hill to plain. But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. What is the contrast here? What's the em what, what is being emphasized in the contrast? The emphasis is on the sound, right? Um, everybody likes the sound of water, 
right? The sound of falling rain is sweet. The, the you know, the bubbling brook, right? The brook that leaps from hill to plain uh, is also a sweet sound, right? But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. Um, what kind of interests me about this is the way that it sort of shifts at the end. That is, the first two lines are setting up, the contrast seems to be the sound. So I'm expecting at the end of that stanza to get the sound of hot water, right? That we're contrasting the sounds, right? Better than those, those sounds are sweet, but better than that is water hot that smokes and steams. What steam rising from hot water? I guess there's a, um, exactly, Tarlonio, that's exactly it. It's not a sound. The smoking and steaming is not a sound, right? Um, but I still think it works, right? What are we getting instead of the falling rain and the, and the leaping brook? The tranquility and the rising steam, right? Um, it's the silence of hot water that seems to be being praised. Or even perhaps, okay, yeah, it doesn't sound like rain. It doesn't sound like a leaping brook, right? It can't compete with the sounds of those, but it's even better, right? It, despite the fact that it doesn't make the sound... Like, the unbalance of the contrast is really strange to me, right? But I think that that seems to be kind of the point. See, I, Mike, I was tempted to go with the, like, the hissing kettle sound, right? Um, but, uh, you know, with the smoking and steaming, right? Um, and maybe, maybe that's what we're talking about. Uh, because, of course, you would, y y to make a, to draw a bath, right, uh, in these days, it's not like you would just turn on the hot water tap, right, in your bathtub. You would need to boil water. Um, so maybe it is talking about a hissing kettle, whistling kettle, um, the kettle is boiling so that you can pour it into the tub to make hot, steamy water. Um, uh, I can get that. I can get that. I mean, I, you know, I'm thinking the same thing, uh, D. Schwab, uh, like the, the lack of sound, the, pe the peaceful silence, the, the image of just like lying immersed in steaming water, right? And the sort of peacefulness and tranquility of that um, as superior to the tranquility and beauty of the falling rain and the leaping brook. But I could get one over to the whole hissing kettle idea um, as like the precursor to the bath, meaning your, your bath water is hot and it's ready to go now, right? Um, next stanza. Oh, water cold, we may pour at need down a thirsty throat and be glad indeed. But better is beer, if drink we lack, and water hot poured down the back. Notice it has the same shape. Right? First two lines, like stanza two, the first two lines are in praise of a good thing, right? Sweet is the sound of falling rain and leaping brooks, right? And then water cold, we may pour it knead down a thirsty throat and be glad indeed. But cold water is sure good when you're thirsty, right? And then the but comes in in line three, just as it did in stanza two, right? Um, but notice there's a twist here. But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot said stanza two, right? But better is beer if drink we lack, says stanza three, and water hot poured down the back, right? Um, so here we have not a contrast, exactly, um, but a sort of rejection, right? Yeah, cold water, uh, if you're really thirsty, cold water is really great. But, um, uh, but beer is better than water. And anyway, there's better things you can do with water, right? Don't pour the water down your throat, right? Save your throat for beer. Pour the water down your back, right? The hot water down your back. Um, so notice how um, uh, notice how the focus has shifted too. Stanza one is or stanza two there is about sound, right? Sweet is the sound. The next stanza is about touch. Right? It's about the feeling of the thirsty throat being eased by cold water or of the hot water being poured down the back. Right, That is even better than the cold water down the throat. Right, And the combination, 
right? Um, uh, you know, beer down the throat and hot water down the back. You know, that's uh, uh, that seems like a good thing, right? Um, yeah. Next stanza. Oh, water is fair that leaps on high in a fountain white beneath the sky. But never did fountain sound so sweet as splashing hot water with my feet. It does it again. It does it again. It mixes, it seems to mix senses again. The first two, li- same shape, right? First two lines praising some other inferior form of water, right? In this case, a fountain. And it seems to be praising the sight of it, right? Um, uh, water is fair that leaps on high in a fountain white beneath the sky. The color of the fountain, right? The image of it leaping up against the sky. Um, its beauty, visual beauty, seems to be what is being emphasized here. And then the butt, right? But the butt again shifts. But never did fountain sound so sweet as splashing hot water with my feet. Now, maybe those first two lines were meant to get at the sound of the fountain, right? I mean, you know, fountains might sound, fountains might sound fair as well. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't sound like that. It does the first two lines really sound like it's talking about, um, it's talking about sight. And then it opposes that, right? It brings in the butt and says, oh, but the fountains don't sound nearly as sweet as the splashing of hot water with my feet in the bathtub. Right. Um, which is why I still, when I go back to, I mean, I, I kind of like the hissing kettle thing. I think that that works. Um, but the shift from the sound of the falling rain and the leaping brook to the stillness of the hot water, um, that kind of opposition seems to me more in line with like, notice there's no real claim, right? Uh, no, bath water, it's bath water is really just not as pretty as a fountain, right? I mean, there might be a lot that you can say about bath water, but you can't say that, right? Um, and so it's like, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn it, right? Yeah, fountains are beautiful, but you know what? I like the sound of water being splashed by my feet even better than I like the sound. Um, it's almost, it's almost like a kind of like deliberate changing of the, uh, um, deliberate changing of the subject, almost. Um, notice overall themes. Notice the praise of domesticity here, right? Um, at the very beginning, why are we praising the bath, right? What does it do? What is what is its initial claim to nobility? that it washes the weary mud away, right? That mud that you get when you're outside doing outdoor things right out there in the, out there in the, in the, in the wide world. And then you come home and you wash the, the mud, the weary mud of the world away. Right. Um, uh, the contrast between boiling water and the rain and the leaping brook, right? The, 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 the fountain leaping on high, not a natural thing, right? Like the lane, like the rain in the brook, um, but still a, an elaborate thing, a, a fancy thing, right? An outdoors thing, um, contrasted with the much quieter pleasure of splashing water with his feet. Um, yes, Crooked Heart says it reminds me of the song Frodo sang earlier about his weary feet. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, the weary mud should certainly make us make us think that, right? And uh, doesn't that make this song even sort of more poignant, especially in the Crick Hollow context, right? He's coming home, right? It's not home. It's his home away from home. It's not really Bag End, but it kind of looks like Bag End, and it's comfortable, and it's nice, and he's had this long journey, but he's come to his journey's end now, right? Because he's moving to Buckland, but now he's home. And so he's going to settle down and he's going to wash the weary mud away. Um, We know his feet are weary, right? We know that he's pursuing the road with weary feet. Um, But of course, we know that his weary feet are nothing like at rest, right? This is no more than a brief pause uh, on his journey. And so I I do think that there's a real poignancy to the song and to this sort of praise of quietness and 
the returning home after a weary day uh, and the, the, the very sort of quiet pleasures, very Baggins-like pleasures. I mean, in this way, I do think the hissing kettle um, works nicely there in stanza two in that it reminds us of Bilbo, right, in The Hobbit, uh, with the kettle just beginning to sing. Um, that kind of quiet domestic sound rather than any kind of more grandiose outdoor uh, um, uh, pleasure or beauty. Um, yes, and good. Uh, Tom reminds us that uh, in Lothlorien, the touch of the river upon Frodo's feet will wash away weariness. Yes, uh, the stream of Nimrodel will do that. Um, so this, uh, um, but that's, of course, an entirely different experience, right? That's an elvish experience, um, uh, markedly different uh, from the Hobbit bathtub here. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Oakwig suggests that well, Pippin's feet at least, right, are more are more like Bilbo's eager feet uh, than Frodo's weary feet, perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good, good. <laughs> ah, Tungle is wondering: Does all this water talk foreshadow Frodo's dream of the ocean? Well, let's see. Uh, Tungo, when we get there, notice the images that we get. Notice the language that's the, all the water language that's being used here, and uh, we'll come back to that and see how reminiscent of some of the imagery here, uh, the imagery in that uh, in that dream is. Certainly, the idea of sea longing is, in general, a fundamentally alien thing to hobbits. Right? Most of them have never even seen the ocean. Um, the idea of a hobbit with sea longing. It's not unheard of, as we know that sailing in ships is at least one thing that at least one took has done in the past, right, under Gandalf's influence, according to The Hobbit. But, um, but still, like, it's sufficiently weird to, to um, you know, be a, um, uh, to be taken as a um, uh, cautionary tale, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yep, Amethor and Frodo is going to have a dream of the ocean, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, all right. Uh, oh, <laughs> Tarlonio, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, the fact that Frodo's parents were drowned. Not sure what to do with that, Tarlonio. Uh, I don't see any evidence of Frodo being scarred by that directly, you know, having negative associations with water. Um, no, they weren't drowned in hot water, Lincoln. Certainly not. Um, and, uh, yeah, it doesn't mean that anyone's going to be afraid of the bath or anything like that, but I'm trying to think of any uh, moment, right? I mean, Frodo... It's not Frodo who is going to be standing out as the one who is most leery of boats and rivers, which you'd think he has the most call to be, right? As the one who is an orphan or who was left an orphan because of a boating accident for his parents. Um, uh, exactly, Harnuth. Frodo isn't afraid of the boat uh, when they when they go boating on the Anduin uh, later on. Frodo, there's no reference to it. So I, I can't see any evidence in the story that Frodo is... If, that there's any sort of lingering negative connection between Frodo and 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 water because of the death of his parents, um, but it's a really great point. I mean, it's a, it's certainly a really interesting point, um, but I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, let's carry on. Let's get into the actual conspiracy now. We'll clear up later, said Mary. Now tell me all about it. Uh, this is, of course, I've skipped the path. I skipped it. See, I skipped like a paragraph, so I feel guilty about that. I skipped the paragraph where they ate the mushrooms, right? And uh, the narrator tells us about the passion uh, of hobbits for mushrooms, which surpasses even the greediest longings of the big people. Uh, they love mushrooms more than any humans do. Um, but uh, but after dinner, we get. I, I wanted to focus on the conspiracy here tonight. 
We'll clear up later, said Mary. Now tell me all about it. I guess that you have been having adventures, which was not quite fair without me. I want a full account, and most of all, I want to know what was the matter with old Maggot, and why he spoke to me like that. He sounded almost as if he was scared, if that's possible. We have all been scared, said Pippin after a pause, in which Frodo stared at the fire and did not speak. You would have been too if you had been chased for two days by black riders. And what are they? Black figures riding on black horses, answered Pippin. If Frodo won't talk, I will tell you the whole tale from the beginning. He then gave a full account of their journey from the time when they left Hobbiton. Sam gave various supporting nods and exclamations. Frodo remained silent. Um, yeah, Nick says it's a little shocking they haven't explained this to Mary yet. Oh, they had business to take care of, Nick, right? They, they had mushrooms to eat, right? So there's... Um, you know, they, there's uh, there's 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 no storytelling until the mushrooms have been uh, have been disposed of. Exactly, it, it, crooked heart. It's about priorities, right? Clearly, clearly. Um, so, a couple things. First of all, notice uh, thinking about Farmer Maggot as we spent a lot of time last time thinking about Farmer Maggot. Um, I love this brief reference by Mary and what it seems to suggest. He sounded almost as if he was scared, if that is possible. I love the idea that the concept of Farmer Maggot being scared of something is almost inconceivable to Mary Brandybuck, right? Doesn't that give you a little bit of a glimpse into... I mean, we saw some glimpses in the way that he, Farmer Maggot, uh, spoke to Pippin, right? Um, Master Peregrine, uh, you know, Master Pippin, Mr. Peregrine took, I should say, right? Remember we talked about that, what his form of address, what his forms of address suggested about his, both his inferiority of social status, but his familiarity with them, right? Um, and obvious friendliness with Mary and with Pippin. Um, but to me, this suggests that Farmer Maggot has a, a high reputation, right? Um, Mary almost can't imagine Farmer Maggot being scared of anything, right? Um, and I think that's really cool. Exactly. He does seem like a larger-than-life figure in, in, in Buckland. That, uh, uh, I, think that that's, um, um, I think that that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good way of a good way of, of of saying that. And of course, remember what we were talking about about Frodo's concept of Farmer Maggot, right? Um, his sort of casting of Farmer Maggot into the role of ogre. Uh, you know, he looms as this almost gigantic figure of terror in the Marish uh, to young Frodo. Um, when back when Frodo's world was so small that Farmer Maggot seemed like the greatest menace. Uh, in you know on his horizon right um, and you can still you can see in Mary's words too a similar thing Mary obviously is not afraid of him does not think of him as an ogre uh, as uh, as Frodo does but still that 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 kind of gigantic stature of farmer maggot seems like uh, um, seems seems pretty clear um, the pause right um, Mary is clearly addressing his words to Frodo. Now tell me all about it, right? I want a full account. I want a full account. And there's a pause. And Frodo stares at the, f at the fire and doesn't speak, right? Frodo doesn't want to give an account. Um, presumably because he doesn't want to say what he guesses. He doesn't want to, uh, say too much. Um, remember, um, uh, Pippin and he having a version of this conversation, right? Then you know or guess something about these riders, Pippin said to him. Um, and he says, I don't know, and I would rather not guess. And Pippin says, okay, you can keep your se your secrets if you wish to be mysterious, right? He's still wishing to keep his secrets and to be mysterious. Uh, and he clearly is not sure how to proceed, as obviously Mary has a right to hear an account, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's not like he's going to 
hide from Mary everything that happened, as if he could keep Pippin from talking about it anyway, but um, surely he doesn't even have a desire to do that, um, and yet he doesn't know what to say or how to say it. Um, so we can see Frodo's awkwardness at the beginning, and again, what is his awkwardness? His awkwardness is, what do I say? How do I say it? How much can I reveal? I have to find a way to tell this story in a way that in which I can kind of connect with my friends to whom I'm grateful and who have been doing so much for me and yet not scare them and not give away stuff that they're not supposed to know, right? So uh, Frodo believes that they're operating on this lower level of knowledge, right? And he's operating on this higher level and he's trying to figure out how can I accommodate, in part anyway, he's trying to figure out how, how can I accommodate my story to their level of understanding, right? Um, so, I, uh, my subtitle for this passage was Wonder and Familiarity. On the one hand, there's wonder here, right? Mary is marveling that Farmer Maggot was scared. Um, he is puzzled at this reference to black riders. They've been chased for two days by black riders, right? What is a black rider, right? Um, in what sense is it black and what does it ride? I mean, he doesn't know even that, right? Um, so we get this mysterious of, you know, uh, a tale of black ri figures riding on black horses. Um, there is much to marvel at here in their story. And yet there is a, uh, um, there is a, 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 a level of familiarity that Mary starts with, right? Um, I always, um, uh, this sentence is the one I always come back to in wanting to... If I had one sentence to show the difference between the Hobbit culture surrounding Bilbo in The Hobbit and the Hobbit culture surrounding Bilbo, at least immediately surrounding Bilbo in The Fellowship of the Ring, it would be that second sentence of Mary's, right? I guess that you have been having adventures, which was not quite fair without me. Um, the idea that, you know, think of Bilbo's attitude towards adventures, right? Think about uh, uh, the respectfulness, the respectability, rather, of the uh, of the Baggins family and the predictability of the Baggins family because they never went on adventures or did anything unexpected, right? Um, that was the norm. That was Bilbo's norm. And now Mary, his perspective is so different that he can say, you've been having adventures, and he's shocked and appalled, right? But he's shocked and appalled for exactly the opposite reason. Not because they had adventures and did unexpected things, but because he got left out of it, right? It is not quite fair to go having adventures without me. And that is, um, that is clearly, um, uh, that is clearly a very, very different place than we saw at all. Um, uh, in uh, in the Hobbit, and yes, exactly, Finn. It is because these four or five Hobbits grew up with Bilbo. We do see the uh, the set of Hobbits, set of young Hobbits that has been influenced by Bilbo, right? That have that have grown up on Bilbo's stories, and uh, and have a very different attitude, a very different perspective on uh, on on the world, right? On adventure, on the Shire, than. Bilbo did, and then all of Bilbo's uh, uh, neighbors and relations did. Um, yeah, now, D. Schwab, you're right to point out that, you know, he says, is it possible that there's hyperbole here? That, uh, they're young still, and an, and an adventure can mean many things. Exactly, yes. Um, on the one hand, he loves, Mary loves the idea of adventures, right? That's the the combination of wonder and familiarity here, right? The idea, the concept of adventures, and you've been off having adventures. He, he, he likes that, right? Uh, he's not only comfortable with it, he desires it. Um, but yes, when he says, I guess that you have been having adventures, which is not quite fair without me, he doesn't realize that they've actually been in danger, right? That they're, that they're, have been actual, like, monsters from Mordor pursuing them. Um, the rest of them don't know necessarily that they're from Mordor, um, but um, at least Frodo doesn't think they could possibly have any idea. Um, but um, so 
Mary is not necessarily being as cavalier as it might sound like he's being, right? That is, he's not he's not actually saying like, ah, I wish I had been there facing deadly peril at your side, right? He may, in fact, he, he might, in fact, say that, but that is not what he's saying here, I don't think. Um, he thinks they've been having adventures of what, like maybe the mushroom-stealing kind, right, or something like that. Um, but uh, um, But certainly the actual adventures they've been having have been of a very different kind than he would have expected. Um, yeah, uh, Lady Shmebulak, I also wonder if he knew would he still be jealous anyways. Um, you know, I'm going to go with yes. I think he would envy them in that they survived, right? Um, and now they have had adventures and can tell stories about their adventures. And I think that he does envy that. Um it's from enough of a distance, right, that um, uh, they, uh, uh, that is, he is, he, both he and they, as they're sitting there in Crick Hollow, are sufficiently distanced from the immediate peril um, that that's not going to be what he, Mary, is primarily thinking about, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's, um, Frodo remains silent, right? So now watch as Frodo tries to figure out what to say and how to say it, right? This is what he's still having a problem with, right? How can I figure out how to address them? Cousin Frodo has been very close, said Pippin, but the time has come for him to open out. So far, we have been given nothing more to go on than Farmer Maggot's guess that it has something to do with old Bilbo's treasure. That was only a guess, said Frodo hastily. Maggot does not know anything. Old Maggot is a shrewd fellow, said Mary. A lot goes on behind his round face that does not come out in his talk. I have heard that he used to go into the old forest at one time, and he has the reputation of knowing a good many strange things. But you can at least tell us, Frodo, whether you think his guess good or bad. I think answered Frodo slowly, that it was a good guess as far as it goes. There is a connection with Bilbo's old adventures, and the riders are looking, or perhaps one ought to say searching, for him or for me. I also fear, if you want to know, that it is no joke at all, and that I am not safe here or anywhere else. He looked round at the windows and walls as if he was afraid they would suddenly give way. The others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaning glances among themselves. It's coming out in a minute, whispered Pippin to Mary. Mary nodded. Um, <laughs> gravity, uh, gravity. Great to meet you at, uh, uh, at Mythmoot, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, points out that Frodo's answer to, uh, was his guess good is no and yes, right? Um, okay. Frodo is trying to stall. He stalls at first just by saying nothing, right? Frodo's not very good at this. He says two things here. And look at the two things that he says, right? Um, first, he protests too much. So far, Pippin says, and Pippin's comment is pretty flippant, right? Um, all he's saying, all Pippin is pointing to is how little they know, right? Nobody has suggested any reason. Pippin has no real clue, right? Or claims to have no real clue why the Black Riders might be searching for them. Or searching for Frodo, in any case, right? Um, so far, we have been given nothing more to go on than Farmer Maggot's guess that it has something to do with old Bilbo's treasure. Frodo's hastiness. That was only a guess. Maggot doesn't know anything. He's protesting too much, right? Um, at the time, Frodo was uncomfortable by the shrewdness of Farmer Maggot's guesses, right? Um, that there are people who want to know what has come of old Bilbo's treasure. Now, the thing is, Farmer Maggot's not as close as all that, right? Frodo, who is thinking of the ring, is thinking like, he knows or he guesses, right? He Somehow, he has made a guess that there is some of the treasure which is desired by others and they've come to hunt for it and, and, and take it back, right? Um, 
the guesses might be shrewd, but at the same time, it's also a little bit obvious, right? There's a strange outlandish person from foreign parts who clearly doesn't mean any good, and he's here looking for Bilbo, right? Everybody knows that Bilbo's gold was got in some strange manner in foreign parts, right? Um, uh, remember the reference to, uh, you know, mysterious gold. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily positively ill-gotten, right? Uh, Bilbo's gold is not positively ill-gotten. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, there's, uh, there's an air of mystery about it. Nobody really knows where it came from. And everybody assumes, you know, as, as, Gam, as Gaffer Gamgee says, right, it was gotten some strange manner in foreign parts. No, that's Farmer Maggot who says that. Gotten some strange manner uh, in, uh, in foreign parts, right? Um, who knows how he got it? He must have gotten it from somewhere or from somebody. And they know enough stories to know that if you come home with part of a hoard, there was probably some, you know, it, I, it, there, it could be any number of explanations, right? It could be a monster's hoard. It could be bandit's treasure. It could be who knows what, right? I mean, but there are lots of different kinds of stories about, um, you know, sort of fairy tale stories about strange treasure that you find in foreign parts and given those stories and those traditions, it's not odd that um, somebody might come hunting down some of that treasure and wanting to reclaim the treasure which Bilbo somehow got, right? Got his hands on. That seems to be the way that Farmer Maggot's thinking, and it's a perfectly logical thought, right? Um, at the same time, Frodo's response, though, shows where his own mind is. He's not thinking in those terms. He's being less shrewd than Farmer Maggot. Um, if he really wanted to conceal things, the thing that Frodo would do would play that up, not play it down. Right? It would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, it's, pro be, it's probably right, right, yeah. It's probably somebody, like, wants some of Bilbo's gold, right? Probably, like, the legend of the wealthy, you know, Mr. Baggins of Bag End has been spread around the countryside, and now somebody is coming to hunt him down, right? That's probably it. That would deflect suspicion away from the... But instead, he's like, oh, no, no, oh, it's probably not Bilbo's treasure. No, mm, mm Yeah, no, he doesn't know anything, right? No, no, no. There's... Maggot doesn't have any facts. Pure speculation, right? It's like, okay, okay, Frodo. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if there's a, if there's a tiny, tiny thread of ring fixation here for Frodo. That is the way that he thinks his anxiety, his hastiness, right? That was only a guess. He seems to be afraid. Now, remember, he thinks they know nothing, right? Nothing. And yet he seems to think that there's some danger that they're going to guess at something like the truth. That they're going to guess maybe there was something special that Bilbo brought back. Maybe there is something precious that is being sought by others, right? And maybe Frodo, you inherited it from Bilbo, right? Maybe you have that now and they're hunting for you because of that, right? It's like, it's almost like he thinks that that's where Farmer Maggot was getting, thinks that that's where his friends are going to go. That doesn't seem to me likely at all. But it, I can understand how it might seem likelier to somebody whose mind is already, in very small ways, beginning to uh, expand on, uh, uh, on the ring, right? Uh, and to sort of fixate a little bit there. Um, yeah, now, Crooked Heart, that's a great question. Um, is he worried his friends are going to try and stop him leaving if they know how much danger he's in? What exactly he's afraid of is an interesting question here, right? Um, and it's not yet clear. Look at his next statement here. I think that it was a good guess as far as it goes. First, his emphasis. I think, right? So I'm going to qualify everything I'm about to say, right? Nothing I'm going to say is authoritative, right? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, Frodo says, right? He's trying to hedge. I think that it was a good guess as far as it goes. There is a connection with Bilbo's old adventures, and the riders are looking, or perhaps one ought to say searching, 
for him or for me. Too much information, Frodo. Frodo is a bad liar. He's a really he's really bad at concealing things here, right? Um, he admits that there is a connection with old Bilbo's adventures, uh, and that they're looking for him in particular, right? There was a long time that I didn't understand why he clarifies, right? Are looking, or perhaps one ought to say searching for him or for me. That is, why does he, why does he shift from looking to searching? What is the significance of that shift? Um, why does he correct looking, um, looking to, 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 to searching, right? Um, and I think the emphasis is that they're target. I think what he's trying to emphasize is that they're targeting him, right? It's not just like to be looking for something is just kind of generally to be hunting for a thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm looking for rich hobbits. I'm looking for Bagginses. They're not just, they're searching for him in particular, right? They have come from afar and they are, they are focused on finding him personally is what I think he's emphasizing in, in shifting from looking to searching. They're just looking around, right? They're hunting for him. Um, that's something. Yeah, Oakwig says Frodo is not speaking with skill in a hard place. No, no, he's really not yet. Um, uh, he'll get better at that, Oakwig, but he's not very good at that yet. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, yes, uh, Crooked Heart. Yes, um, is wondering if uh, maybe he's thinking of the sniffing of the riders as well, right? Or perhaps one ought to say searching, right? You can't exactly call it looking, can you, as they seem to be hunting by smell. Um, maybe that's part of it as well, that he's also acknowledging that um, these things are weird, right? If they're looking, if you could call it looking, right? In any case, they're searching by some uh, by some means. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, He's already saying too much, right? Because uh, notice what it, what he reveals in that sentence. There is a particular thing that Bilbo found in his adventures, right? There is a connection with Bilbo's old... Something that Bilbo did in his old adventures is the reason the writers are here, right? He has volunteered that information. And, of course, he's also implying he knows what it is, right? Um, and that the writers are looking or searching for Bilbo or for him, right? So that also implies fairly clearly that whatever it was that in Bilbo's adventures that led to the Black Riders hunting for him has been passed down to Frodo, right? He didn't have to volunteer all that information. So for somebody who's trying to not give stuff away, again, he's doing a pretty bad job. Um, it's interesting to see the... Um, the sort of struggle between honesty and the desire to be honest with his friends and the desire to conceal this information. But again, the question we were asking before, which is not yet to me obvious, why? Why is he hiding it, right? What is his motivation for hiding, for trying to conceal this stuff? Um, but look where he goes after this. I also fear, if you want to know, that it is no joke at all and that I am not safe here or anywhere else. He looked round at the windows and walls as if he was afraid they would suddenly give way. The others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaning glances. I think in that last sentence we see Frodo's fear just kind of, in a sense, taking over. Um, I am not safe here or anywhere else. Um, on the one hand, he's setting up for the transition to... I have to go, right? Which is what he knows he has to tell them. But at the same time, he looked around at the windows and walls as if he was afraid they would suddenly give way. We see his own imagination being overwhelmed by his fear of the riders, right? To go from the abstract concept, I'm probably not safe here and they might find me and I'm still in danger, to the much more sort of abstract, nightmarish kind of imagination 
you know, the windows and walls are suddenly going to vanish or suddenly going to collapse and the Black Riders are going to be right there, right? It's, it's like this, this nightmare sequence uh, is playing out in his imagination right there, right? Um, and that seems to be another impulse there to share his fears with his friends. Right? And I think that's another thing that we see, you know, we, we've got the thing that is leading him to want to conceal it but on the other hand, we have one, his desire not to lie to his friends. He doesn't tell any lies. Um, and he doesn't, it doesn't seem to occur to him. He could make up a lie, but he doesn't make up a lie. He doesn't even gesture towards making up a lie. Right? So he wants to be honest with his friends. And he clearly does want to share with his friends. Um, uh, I also fear, if you want to know, right? Uh... He does want to share that with them. Um, yes, Finn says he also uh, uh, went to not just thinking about how unsafe he is, but verbalized it for probably the first time since talking to Gandalf back in Chapter 2. Yes, yes. Other than to an extent with Gildor the Elf, but but yeah, absolutely. Um, now that last line is really interesting from a framework perspective. It's coming out in a minute, whispered Pippin to Mary. Mary nodded. Notice the effect that this has on the narration, right? We, the readers, are being made privy to a side conversation which Frodo doesn't hear, right? There's, um, we are kind of seeing over Frodo's head here. We're in the know. And I love how this creates the situation that, Everybody, including us as readers, is in the know, right? Frodo is the only one in the room who does not know that everybody knows, right? He's the only one who thinks that a secret is being maintained. Um, here, uh, 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 Tolkien's narrator kind of tips his hand to us, right? And shows us that they, they know. They know what's coming, right? This isn't a mystery to them. The only mystery is... Frodo's, right, that he doesn't know that everybody knows, right? Um, but the fact, what fascinates me about how Tolkien does this here is that he's not trying to take us by surprise. The reveal of the conspiracy is not meant to shock us. We are brought into it just in advance, right? We are brought into the secret. Um, we are made part of the conspiracy very briefly, right? Uh, with Frodo on the other side. Um, and uh, Tony, I don't think that Frodo can hear. Uh, uh, Tony was saying he gets the impression that Pippin was loud whispering uh, and Frodo could hear that. I don't think so. Frodo's response, I mean, look what Frodo's going to go on to say. Well, said Frodo at last, sitting up and straightening his back as if he had made a decision, I can't keep it dark any longer. I've got something to tell you all, but I don't know quite how to begin. Right? Um, Frodo is silent still after this. You know, the others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaning glances among themselves, right? Um, he's not seeing their meaning glances and he's not overhearing them because when he finally comes to a decision, so he's having, he's, he's having a hard time making his decision, right? Of whether or not to tell them and how to tell them. And he, um, uh, he, so yeah, he's, he was having a hard time making that decision. Um, and it took him a long time to get there, right? If he had heard them say, it's coming out in a minute, he would have clearly said, wait, what? What are you talking about? What do you know, right? But the, you know, the way and he's like, I can't keep it dark any longer, as if he had succeeded in doing so, right? I, I, I'm I going to reveal a secret. I've got something to tell you all. He wouldn't talk that way if he'd heard them. Um, but so, so again, but there's another reason I think this. The sentence before. The others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaning glances among themselves. Right? There, too, we are being made privy. We see the meaning glances. It's like we're peeking backstage at the conspiracy. Um, and again, I think that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, now, uh, interesting. Um, Aururi, Au, Auruiron? Auruiron. Auruiron? 
I'm trying to figure out how many syllables are in your name. Um, but anyway, um, I love Aruri, Aruri, Aruri Ron. I keep putting the R in the wrong place. Aruri Ron's point that um, there's a hidden parallel, parallel between this and Bilbo's party speech, uh, a measured lead up to announce an abrupt departure from the Shire. Um, yes, there is a parallel there, right? Frodo intends this to be the surprise, right? Um, he's not going to have a joke at his friend's expense, right? He approaches it, obviously, completely differently. But yes, that this this moment, you know, the decision that Frodo makes and, you know, uh, I've got something to tell you all, you know, I have an announcement, right, um, is similar, right? It, or parallel, I guess you can say. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, Finn says Gildor's talk makes the point even more important. Frodo knows he can't wait even a day for Gandalf after his talk with the elf. Frodo is now put to the point of, I have no choice. I have to tell my friend something. Um, yes, Finn, that would seem to have been the cop-out, right? To wait for Gandalf, to, to get to Crick Hollow and hang out there for a little while longer and see if Gandalf is going to come. Right, because if Gandalf comes, then he doesn't. He can at least procrastinate telling his uh, his friends anything, right? Um, but he, you're right that he uh, he has been deprived of that option when Gildor tells him not to wait even a day. Um, he's got to go immediately. Uh, he uh, he does not fear the enemy enough, right? But he can't fear it too much. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah um, Brandon says that he thinks that Pippin was probably audible to Frodo, but he doesn't think that Frodo heard him. Um, possibly. Possibly. You know, how audible Pippin was, I don't know for sure. That Frodo didn't hear him seems to me pretty clear. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Uh, we're still trying to answer the question, what is Frodo afraid of, right? What is it that he dreads? Well, said Frodo at last, sitting up and straightening his back, I can't keep it dark any longer. I have got something to tell you all, but I don't know quite how to begin. I think I could help you, said Mary quietly, by telling you some of it myself. What do you mean? said Frodo, looking at him anxiously. Just this, my dear old Frodo. You are miserable because you don't know how to say goodbye. You meant to leave the Shire, of course, but danger has come on you sooner than you expected, and now you are making up your mind to go at once, and you don't want to. We are very sorry for you. Frodo opened his mouth and shut it again. His look of surprise was so comical that they laughed. "'Dear old Frodo,' said Pippin, "'did you really think you had thrown dust in all our eyes? "'You have not been nearly careful or clever enough for that. "'You have obviously been planning to go "'and saying farewell to all your, all your haunts "'all this year since April. "'We have constantly heard you muttering, "'Shall I ever look down into that valley again, I wonder?' "'and things like that, "'and pretending you had come to the end of your money "'and actually selling your beloved bag end "'to those Sackville Bagginses "'and all those close talks with Gandalf.' Okay, um, we're uh, coming towards the end here. I'm going to stop uh, soon. Didn't get nearly to where I wanted to get. We'll do the second half of the conspiracy next time. Um, but um, first, look at Mary's interpretation. Uh, we were trying to figure out what is it that Frodo was afraid of? Why is he wanting to see? Why is he wanting to hold back information from his friends? We see Mary's interpretation of that. Right? Mary's opinion on that question. Mary opines that Frodo is miserable because he doesn't know how to say goodbye. Right? That's what's bothering him. That seems to me dead on. Again, remember, I think that the his um, looking around the Crick Hollow House in that in that first passage we looked at tonight is really laced with that uh, m being miserable because he doesn't know how to say goodbye element. You meant to leave the Shire, but danger has come on you sooner than you expected, and now you're making up your mind to go at once, and you don't want to. We're very sorry for you. 
So the two things that Mary points to, um, what you want to say is, you're miserable because you don't know how to say goodbye and you don't want to go, really, anyway. Um, and that's really interesting because it's perfectly clear that that was not what Frodo was going to say, <laughs> right? Uh, Frodo was not, you know, Mary says, I, I can help you by saying some of it myself, myself right? But that was not, I think, any part of what Frodo was going to say. Maybe I don't know how to say goodbye might have been part of what he was going to say or what he was not saying or why he was not saying things, right? But that second one is interesting because here Mary seems to put his finger on something which Frodo does not really sort of admit to himself. Frodo does not seem to be thinking that. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. He knows that he needs to go, right? He's afraid of the Black Riders and having those kind of nightmare sequences of the walls vanishing and the Black Riders riding in upon him, right? So um, this is, uh, he knows he has to go. Mary is able here to voice something that he himself doesn't fully understand, right? Or won't acknowledge, really. Um, you don't want to go. We're very sorry for you. Um, now look at Pippin's emphasis. You, um, what does Pippin emphasize that they know and how they know it? Item. We have caught you saying goodbye to things ever since April, right? It has been perfectly obvious that you're planning to leave the Shire because you've been wandering around and saying goodbye to everything. Item. You sold your beloved bag end. You've been pretending that you've come to the end of your money. They know he hasn't really come to the end of his money, right? And they have noted that he's actually gone as far as selling bag end in order to make that convincing, right? So we know you're leaving. We know that you have like a reason for concealing the reasons why you're leaving because you made up a fake reason to leave, right? Namely that you've got poor. And C, we can see that it must be really important because you're willing to go to very great and painful lengths in order to make your fake story believable. So these are all deductions that they have made, could have made, simply from his own actions, right? Um, and all those close talks with Gandalf. Okay, that's the fourth point. So notice this is all within the scope of their observation. These are all things that they could have perhaps did, in fact, conclude on their own, right? Deductions that they could have made simply from observing Frodo. Um, all those close talks with Gandalf. Uh, when, since when has he been planning to go and saying farewell to his old haunts, right? Since April, i.e. since Gandalf came and he had all those close talks with Gandalf, right? So you would shut up talking to Gandalf for, you know, days on end, right? And then after that, you started saying goodbye to everything and you invented this fake story and even sold Bag End, right? It's clear that something is up. So in other words, Pippin's first response is not to give away that they have any inside information. Um, and con in conjunction with Mary's claim earlier on, Mary seems to be stating the conclusion, which is the result of those de individual deductions, right? You meant to leave the Shire. But danger has come on you sooner than you expected. It's clear that you didn't expect the Black Riders, right? You were not on guard against those. You were taken on... Pippin's story shows that you were taken on the hop by that. So, uh, they therefore have some kind of a key to why he had to go and why he invented a fake story, right? Because he's in trouble. Because he's in danger. That's why he's leaving. And presumably, that's why he's making up a fake story about why he has to leave and is willing to sacrifice even Bag End itself in order to make that story believable. So again, all of these things... Um, at first, are things that they could simply have deduced on their own. No conspiracy has yet been unmasked, apart from the fact that they've clearly all been in cahoots and have been talking about this, right? The glances among them, the whispered aside, right? 
Um, here it sounds like, and it certainly seems to Frodo. What do you mean, right? Um, Frodo is merely thinking, oh dear, I've been transparent, right? I've been trying to keep this a secret, and it's not a secret. They figured it out, right? They've seen right through me. Um, they know. Remember, he was kind of worried about that. I almost said paranoid about that with Farmer Maggot, too, right? And in talking about it. Maggot doesn't know anything, right? Um, quick to be sort of suspicious in this way. Um, all right, we'll pause there. Next week, be back next week. No three-week gap here. Uh, I am probably going to have to... I'm pretty much certainly going to have to skip another week, the first week of July, but I'll be back. Uh, I still have several more weeks before that. So uh, next week we'll pick up right here in the middle of the conspiracy and go to the end and to, the, to their, their song, um, which means you can do some reading ahead. Go to the, the song that they sing, the song that they've prepared. Compare and contrast that with the original. Go back to The Hobbit, um, chapter one of The Hobbit, and look at the original dwarf song that they've modeled it on, right? Look not only at the song itself, uh, the structure of the song, the content of the song, the focus of the song, but also at the context, that is, the role that that song plays in Bilbo's departure. And then go back to the Hobbit song here in chapter five, and because we're going to do some comparing and contrasting, right? Um, so, um, yeah. So think about that, right? Think about that, and I, we will. My goal will be to get there next week. I'm fairly confident we can do that, and then we'll start looking towards the old forest uh, in the uh, the week after that. So, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go on our field trip now. Um, and tonight I was going to do, I was thinking of doing a Buckland related field trip again, but most of the Buckland stuff is old forest oriented and we're not going to venture into the old forest yet because it's not old forest time. We're still in the conspiracy. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go exploring, uh, to some places where we haven't been yet, but sort of following up on places where we have been. Um, I would like to... Uh, we're not going to have time to do... See, it's it's interesting. As you guys know, uh, you know many of you have followed the adventures of uh, Grifflet the Hobbit Burglar um, uh, on my Friday afternoon Lotro streams uh, as I've been going through the quest lines. And Grifflet has been really focused with the kind of, you know, blinkered, dedicated focus that Grifflet always has uh, on following the quest, the quest lines and the stories, right, that, um, that the Lotro folks have built into the game. Um, the... Uh, the thing that I would kind of like to do is look more at sort of a more systematic exploring of the world. We've been exploring different elements in the in the Shire, and of course, any time we get to the, the direct connections and direct adaptations, either of storylines and story elements and story themes uh, from the book that we're, uh, as we're discussing it, or of places in the book uh, that we're discussing, we'll, we'll, we will look at those things and see what Lotro does with those. But in between times, uh, the thing I want to do is to, to kind of look at the story of the world. With Grifflet, I've never really had a chance to go through and kind of more systematically explore um, uh, explore the map. Uh, and so that's what I want to do. So today, we are going to Even Dim. Um, we can start... I think I'm just going to end up galloping, um, but uh, we can. St so I'm I'm probably just going to go to Mickle Delving and gallop from there. So those of you who don't have travel points can join me. Uh, others of you can join me either at Oat Barton or at Dwalling, uh, and we're going to go from there up north into Even Dim. That's what I want to to do to be looking at the land north of the Shire. So let's uh, take off and let's hope I can do this okay one handed. I don't normally steer this hand. It's always a really sharp corner there. Okay, so we're going to go we're going to go further up into even dim. The even dim area. Uh, we won't get so far as the lake tonight. 
All right, so let's uh, let's mount up. Where's my cursor? There it is. All right. Here we go, down into Bree proper. And then we will head... Now, I do... Of course, it would be quicker to get there, probably from Tinadir, certainly, than Mikkel Delving. Um, but I don't want to approach from the north. I want to approach from the south. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't want to go to either Ostfarad or Tinadir. So... Yeah... I can't get to Oat Barton from here. So, fine. Nickel delving it is. All right. Okay. Hey, Brandon, did you just make a VeggieTales reference in the chat? It's pretty cool. Um, all right. So let's head off in the vague direction of Brocken Borings and from there north as we gallop through the now familiar zones of the Shire. Interesting. Amethorn says that uh, he's been doing the scavenger hunt, uh, and it really hit me just how huge, despite its compression of Middle Earth, uh, Lotro is, and they're not done building it. It's true. I mean, uh, when you're looking at any particular area, and um, uh, you know, kind of thinking about it in conjunction with the Middle Earth map, or when you you know go to the story and read the description of their travels, and then you travel in the same you know the same stretch of ground, or from point the same point A to the same point B uh, in game. Of course, it's easy to get um, you know really struck by the smallness of the game, right? Because of the scale that they sort of necessarily have to use, but. Um, but you're absolutely right. Lotro's very big. Uh, there is a lot of area uh, in this game. Um, Middle Earth is quite large, and even at this scale, it's uh, there's quite a lot of it. So, all right, um, we are coming in towards Hobbiton here, and kind of skirting around the far side of Hobbiton. You can see the party field, and there's the hill, of course. You know, Sandyman's Mill is adorable. Just think how sad it's going to be to see that thing torn down. Right? I mean, it's cute. So cute. Yeah. Um, yeah, Amethorn, I just love it too. Um, you know, I wonder if they... They probably did, right? They probably did, because I know they're, they were thinking about the scouring from the very beginning. Um, the mill at Hobbiton is one of the buildings that is explicitly um, described as being pulled down, right? You know, that we know that that building is going to get destroyed in the scouring. And um, it's... Uh, it's one of the few buildings for which that is true. Um, you know, there are a few others that we know are going to suffer, but very few other, like, particular buildings uh, that are going to... Uh, that we know are doomed, right? And the mill is certainly one of them. And it's a central one, right? It's a, it's a, it's a fairly symbolic one um, because uh, it's... Um, the whole impulse to which at least one, right, and possibly more hobbits uh, fall, that sort of uh, impulse of modernity, right, to pull down, you know, the old, uh, which is good, and to replace it by 
that which is modern and more efficient and new and uh, and supposed to be better in some sense, um, but not really better in every sense. All right, so we're going to continue on this way and go north over the green fields up to Oat Barton here, back past the big old statue of Bull Roar. And up across the green fields. Um, yeah. Yep. Back, the holes in Bagshot Row. Yes. Yes. They are. Uh, we know that um, uh, poor gaffers' taters are not long for this world, right? That is certainly, that is certainly another thing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, Brandon, it's a great question. How bad is the ugly new mill going to be, right? Um, I think it's going to be huge. Um, it's got to be a terrible eyesore. Um, and it's heartbreaking to think of, right? But I, it's one of the things I think that... Think how familiar the... Um, think how familiar the... And, and the party tree, right? I know, right? Uh, Tarlonio, I mean, that's uh, so sad to think of. Um, but... Um, I, it's one of the things that I think is super effective um, in the in the the design of the game. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say hi to the. Uh... Hello there. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, that's great. Okay, keep going northward to dwelling. Um, I think the game has the chance to make the scouring of the Shire. This is going to sound blasphemous, but in a sense, hit even harder than it does in the books. Um, in the book, we get a description of it, right? That is, we get a description of how horrible it was, how um, how hard it hit the hobbits, right? How terrible it was for them to see all of these wonderful things that they loved and all the beauty of the Shire torn down. We're told about that, but we don't have the same experience of that ourselves. Um, like the mill, right? We're told that the old mill was torn down and this horrible, ugly new mill was put in its place, and that's too bad. But, um, but you know, it's not, um, uh, it's not awful. Um, I, that again, we don't have that experience of awfulness. We don't really know the old mill. In the game world, again, think of how familiar the Shire Hobbit, the 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 Hobbit country is, right? The Shire landscape that we've been riding through in our field trips on an almost weekly basis, right? You know, we've seen this this place a lot that we've just ridden through. Uh, we're about to go into almost new territory. Well, we will get to new territory that we haven't done on our field trips yet, um, but. Um, I'll just wait here in case anybody else is still coming up here to dwelling. Um, but uh, again, we've got, a, we've got a nice little group here and still a couple of people arriving. But again, the point is, right, it's all so familiar. Think about those of us, those of you, I mean, Lotro's 10 years old now, right? Some of you have been, uh, uh, you know, immersed in that Shire geography for the last 10 years, right? Are as familiar with in-game Hobbiton, almost, right, as the residents of Hobbiton were. Um, when you go back to the Shire, when the scouring comes along, when you come back to the Shire and you see this landscape th that has been, that is so enormously familiar uh, to you, uh, and you see it marred, and you see trees knocked down everywhere, and you see things dug up, and uh, ugly new modern houses built, and the old mill destroyed, and the party tree taken down. Uh, think how horrible that's going to be, right? There's going to be a kind of visceral experience of that because of the familiarity that we've gained with the Shire, um, which is, I think, going to be qualitatively different from what we get in the book, which is, in a sense, secondhand. Uh, so I think it's, um, uh, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. It's an element of their adaptation, um, which is not even something necessarily, which could have been predicted, but, um, 
but is 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 a way, you know, the way that the game has developed over time and thus enabled uh, the players to be able to develop that kind of familiarity and experience. I think it's uh, it's it 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 could make the scouring of the Shire just incredibly powerful. I think uh, so. I am super excited for this. I am more excited about the scouring of the Shire than I am for Mordor. Mordor is going to be awesome, right? Mordor is coming soon. The Mordor expansion will be out soon. Um, that's great, but uh, and and I, you know, that'll 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 be good. But I'm really looking forward to the scouring of the Shire. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, oh, you think we're going to get to let's see, or Ruiron? You think we're going to get to uh, Harad and Rune first? I don't think so. I think we're going to do the scouring first, probably. But, um, all right. Okay. Anyway, let's carry on. So here we are now heading north from here. Now we know this was, this is like the edge of Hobbit civilization. And it's the part of Hobbit civilization, by the way, where, uh, um, Lotho Sackville Baggins, as we learned right, a couple months back, has been buying up land, right? This is not where uh, Sackville is, right? This is not where his, his family land uh, is, but it is, um, uh, it's where he's been buying up extra land, and that's why the ruffians are there, because he brought in the ruffians originally to work. Um, so we're heading, heading north from, from here. We're coming into desert country. And that I think is kind of, first of all, we've been here before, right? Um, we've been in this place when we were doing the Christopher Tolkien quest, uh, from, uh, uh, from Ronald Dwale, from the Tolkien character in, uh, uh, in, in dwelling back there. And this is where we found the, uh, the, the Roverandum, uh, little toy dog buried in the sand here. Um, I hope that nobody is in peril here among us. I clearly, we have some people who can take care of uh, any mobs that attack any lower level characters that are with us, but um, as these guys are in, what, the 20s? Is it? Oops. Well, well he's not anymore. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so, notice the line of cliffs with the stone walls on top, right? We pass through the stone walls. The stone walls look to be of hobbit make. They're hobbit-sized, they're like other stone walls in other parts of the Shire, and they don't have, they don't look, they're not broken off, right? They don't look like ruins. These are not fragments of Arnorian ruins. Those are good hobbit stone walls, um, which form a marker. Uh, it's interesting, like, from this, you know, we can see the, we can see the, the, the you know, these sort of bluffs um, uh, from the lowlands down here that lead up to the northern fringe of the Hobbit lands there. This is really kind of the boundary of Hobbit civilization up in this direction we're in. Uh, even Dims here, you can see how we are just north of all the things, right? Just about to the part which was really pure Arnurian. Um, but anyway, so I, on this fringe, you can see I love the wall along the bluffs there which looks from a distance as if it were like crenellations, right? It looks like a defensive fortification, but it's not a defensive fortification, right? It's just a low stone wall with a whole bunch of gaps in. Um, it's designed to sort of discourage livestock from falling off the cliff. It's not designed to, to keep this at bay, and yet we have this sort of walled uh, barrier, right, of the hills between this and what is like literally a desert, right, the desert wilderness, uh, to the north of it. Um, this is the, remember what, uh, lies beyond the borders of the Shire on Shire maps? White spaces, right? And it's like, here it is, right? Here's the white space. This is why the white spaces, there's just nothing interesting up here, right? It's just, uh, you know, uh, well, a bunch of bugs and lizards and, uh, and sand. Why would any hobbit even come up here, right? You can sort of see, you can sort of see that. But when we look around, we see, wait, hang on a second. There is something here, right? There is stuff here, or rather, there is the memory of others who were here. If we look up on the hills that are looking down, so there's, again, there's the Hobbit Heights, right? Um, but, of course, the Hobbits don't live up on the heights, as is no surprise, right? They live on the plains up here, but when we cast our eyes further up, we can see 
the remnants of the higher civilization, literally higher in this case, that once lived there. And here we have these Arnorian ruins. And notice the difference between these Arnorian ruins and the Arnorian ruins that we saw and were looking at before down in the Shire. Right, we were looking at those towers, like the stock tower. We were looking at um, uh, uh, <laughs> looking between horses' legs here. Let me get to first person view here. Yeah, there we go. Um, the um, uh, we're looking at the stock tower, looking at various walls. In other words, it was mostly defensive stuff because the Shire was way down on the sort of close to the southern frontier of Arnor back in the day. Um, that was the, that was the edges, right? Um, here, that's not a fortress. Look at those windows, right? Look at the, this is just like a little domed thing. This looks like a, what, a house, right? Not a castle, not a fort, not a fortress up on top of that hill. Um, more like a big old Arnorian country home. Um, let's uh, let's look around some more. Let's carry on. Let's uh, go. I'm gonna head out towards the river because we were able to see the Arnorian stuff, like those towers and things along the river, before, right? So there's south, and we don't see much up here. So let's go right to the edge of the river and look down. And see this, I lo again, I love the cliffs lining the opposite side, right? Look how, I mean, n no hobbit's going to go wandering over there, right? It's like the other side of the world over there, right? Who wants it? See, no, I don't see anything downstream, right? It's all quiet. Now we turn around upstream. Ooh. More ruins, right? As we get closer to the heart of old Arnor. Right? So let's go up the Baranduin, as they would have called it. And let's explore some of the evidence of Arnorian civilization here. Because that's ultimately what Even Dim is all about, right? Even dim is the heart of them. What is this? Oh, this is just, this is not, these are not ruins. From a distance, these look like ruins. No, those are like bug nests. We don't, we're not interested in that. Uh, there are some quests that you go on that, uh, you know, where you're supposed to, like, kill off the bugs and stuff. But that's not what we're interested in. Let's look at the Arnorian ruins. Look at that. Okay, we got ruins all over the place here. Oh, look at this. Hey, it's a wall. But notice, what kind of wall is this? Not a fortification, right? This might be a couple different kinds of things. Maybe it's part of an old aqueduct or something. Maybe it was part of a hall. But it wasn't a defensive fortification. This was not a frontier wall, right? Look at that window. Look at that. Who would do that? Maybe it's a doorway that used to have a strong door in it. But I'm doubtful, right? It just does not look all that defensible. It's tall. It's thick. But it's not all that defensible. Um, and then, wah look at that colossal statue. We'll get to him. But let's go over here. So again, imagine... Imagine sailing, right? You're sailing up the river, right? Into old Arnor. You're a Numenorian, right? So you do ships. Ships are your thing. And what do you get? These are all... Look at the... Again, these are not... They're walls, but they're the walls of buildings. They're not defensive works. So there were all these buildings all along here. What would these buildings have been? Who knows? Something connected to the river? Certainly right down by the river. Here's another sort of biggish one, right? Now this is uh, Lithost here. Uh, does anyone remember? I've, I've done all these quests. I did the completionist even dim, but it's been 
a couple of years now since I did that. Um, does anyone recall the story of this place? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a, a great, uh, a great mortality of the bog guardians here of this place. Um, but, um, hey, what are they attacking my horse? That's rude. Again, none of these look to me like defensive fortifications. They look like, um, what could they be? Warehouses, um, you know, sort of harbors. Look at this. Again, we have these buildings up on the cliff sides, right? Those would be highly defensible, except they're not defenses. This is a little dome, just like the one up on the hill above uh, above dwelling, right? Look at this big archway. Now, again, you could put a nice gate there, right? And there's um, uh, there does seem to be a wall around the rest. But what would, what do you think was the purpose of this? A lookout? A trading post? A, a sort of way, you know, way stop along the river up to Anuminus. If you look at where we are now on the map, you can see, right? Um, uh, see, we're right near the joining of two ways. So another river comes in there from the west, or from the east, rather, right? Uh, where did we get that? Oh, right there, right? Yeah. So there's where it comes in. So... Again, I'm thinking like trading post or something. Um, Holligro says there is a barracks over there. Yes, yes, there is. And it's the, it's a custom house. Right, right, sure. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, there is a... Let's see, where's the ship? There's a sunken ship in here. If we swim across. I forget exactly where it is. Somewhere around here. We can see where a ship went down. But we know that there was somewhere around here. Um, ah, yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, we know that the Numenorians were great sailors, right? Um, and would have. This is why, again, I was speculating about the Brandywine Bridge, right? And I think, by the way, there is a reference. I had forgotten it. I forgot somebody emailed me about this, and I totally forgot. Um, uh, but somebody had emailed me about the, the reference, because there is a reference of the Bridge of the Stone Bows that they crossed, that uh, Marco and Blanco crossed when they went in, into the Shire, uh, that the Stone Bridge, which is presumably the Brandywine Bridge, which did predate the settlement of the Shire, in which case... I don't think it could possibly have looked like what the what the Lotro Brandywine Bridge looks like. Because, again, it's too low. No ship could go under it. Uh, and even the fact that it was named the Bridge of the Stone Bows suggests to me that it was a high-arched bridge, um, look, looking like a bent bow. Because, again, the Numenorians would have to have sailed ships under it. So I think that their impulse here to have Numenorian uh, uh, trading ships... Uh, so you see, this is almost a barge, basically, by Numenorean standards, um, which tragically sank here right next to the Custom House, uh, and probably has nothing to do with smuggling. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry. This isn't the Legend of Zelda. We're not going to run out of stamina and drown. Um, yeah, yeah, um... Let's go over and explore this ruin a little bit. Now, again, I love this sort of dominant subplot of uh, uh, of Even Dim that the primary enemies, the primary recurring enemies of either of the whole Even Dim region, are these brigands and looters. Right? It's a tomb robber. Right? A desperate tomb robber in this case. He's about to get a good deal more desperate. Um, the whole, like the central plot, the central theme of the story of Evendim as they've created it, is of 
the Dunedine and the connections of the Dunedine, trying to preserve the cultural heritage of Arnorok. The whole thing is this big, like, historical preservation push, right? And you've got the tomb robbers and the people who come here just trying to loot the old Arnorian ruins, knowing that there might be relics here. And again, this seems to me a very, you know, I, 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 I love this thread, right? I think it's really, really neat um, because it seems to me to play very true uh, to the world as they're depicting it here. Um, that is to say, on the one hand, you have the remnants of not only an ancient civilization, but a far greater civilization, a, civil, a civilization in the Numenorians that was far greater in power and technology than any modern civilization still is. So certainly, if you can find anything that they made, right, any of the products of the Numenorians, that's going to be incredibly valuable and incredibly helpful, right? So that you would have brigands who would try to enrich themselves by... Uh, you know, looting through the ruins of Arnor, that seems to make perfect sense, right? Given the Third Age situation that has been described, that the Dunedain would want to prevent that, right? Let's prevent the inevitable erosion of Arnor. Let us preserve and respect the memory of Arnor and not let, uh, you know, these unscrupulous people just carry off the stuff that also makes a great deal of sense, and that they would want to maintain these ruins and these relics, uh, even though there's nothing they can do with them, right? They don't live here. I mean, they don't live in the ruins, the Dunedain, right? Uh, they can't reconstruct the kingdom, uh, but they can at least keep people from picking over the bones, right, of the ruins. Um, uh, so that's uh, um, it's it's in my mind a very uh, a very interesting and very plausible kind of plot. But see, look at this building, right? The whole thing. Look at look at these buttresses and stuff. This is all. This is not. That central building looks more like a cathedral than it looks like a. a fortress, right? You can see that we are getting to the heart, closer to the heart of a peaceful realm, right? Not a realm at war. Not a military installment. This was never designed, really, to withstand assault. It's got this wall, right, around the compound, but even that, I mean, what was this? Right? Not part of a defensive fortification. These gateways are a little large for uh, a defensive fortification. And again, we go up the hill and into the central area, and what do we have? Big old gaps in the walls that look like the remnants of windows. We've got big old doors like those there. We've got huge totally unnecessarily large arches. Again, more more cathedral-ish than, uh, than castle-ish. Again, what you get is the glimpse of a piece of not only an older society, but a superior society, right? And look at the brigands squatting here, right? Look at the contrast. Not just with the tent and the crates, right? But the piles of rubbish lying around. The crude campfire with the logs. That's even dim, right? That's what we see. You see what I'm getting at? And this is, I think, you know, it's one of the things that I find so much fun about the, the Lotro adaptation. Um... Their storylines are great. Their storylines are wonderful fun. Um, and really clever and really interesting and engage with the story and the themes of the story of the book in really interesting ways. But I love what they've done with the world. They've had a lot of white spaces around the edges of maps, right, that they needed to fill in. Um, but, uh, and they've done that. They've done that very intelligently. Uh, and very, very thoughtfully. 
So in the distance, we get this colossal statue. Let's cross the river again. I want a clearer view of the statue. I want to get get them right between those trees there. There we go. That thing is huge. Can you see who it is? Look at the symbol that he's carrying in his left hand. You've got that like crescent thing with the spiky bit on top. It looks like a spear, but I don't think that is a spear. That symbol is clearer to see in other places. See, look, the shaft ends right down there. Not a spear, doesn't go all the way to the ground. Okay, he's got a seven pointed star around his neck. He's got a seven pointed star bound to his forehead. He has a long beard to suggest venerability and respectability he has what is not a staff what is not a spear but what seems to be a scepter in his left hand and in his right hand a broken sword right elendo clearly elendo right um and it's also clear to see that this is a posthumous statue, right? Uh, obviously, his sword was not broken until he died. Um, so this statue was erected in the after days of Numenor, or of Arnor, rather, in memory of Elendil, um, emphasizing his age, right? The first king of Arnor of old. His rule... Right? The scepter of Anuminus in his hand. Um, his strength, his self-sacrifice with the broken sword, which of course the uh, um, you know would have been the right, you know, the shards of Narsil, right? Um, and the star of Numenor, both on his breast and on his brow. Um, that would be the Elendilmir, right? Uh, that was bound to his brow. The thing that was handed down to Isildur, but then was lost with Isildur when he died in the Gladden Fields. We can see the Baranduin comes around the corner up here by some more of these nice buildings. Look at more of them over here. You see as we get closer and closer to the heart of uh, even them, they're all over the place, right? Look how thickly settled this place used to be. And the river flows right between the legs of the statue of Elendil, right? He straddles the river. Uh, he, Elendo himself, is the gateway, right? That all ships would have, have to pa had to pass through in order to come to Enuminus, the city of the kings. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, Amethorn, I agree. They make this too small. Again, there shouldn't be a, a walkway in there. It's, I, you're absolutely right. You should be able to sail through the legs. You would need to be able to sail through the legs. It's the other place where they've forgotten about that and made the bridge too small, like it was in the Shire. should have been bigger. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, you notice what, they're, what Lotro is imagining here. Right? It's not just imagining Elendil as he was, which is a pretty cool thing to imagine anyway, but it's imagining Arnor, which is something we almost never get in the books. Right? We learn about Arnor, we know that Arnor existed, 
but we don't get um you know we we get almost no reference to it yeah somebody help that poor person who's running away from the things uh and what level are you level nine yeah we've got a poor level nine person who's getting who's getting slaughtered or will get slaughtered if we're not careful thanks for protecting the low bees there um anyway the kingdom of arnor in its glory we sort of hear about we don't even hear much about it you can hear about you know some in the tale of years and and in appendix a um but even there we don't get that many details of it uh so here in even dim as we come up to near Enuminous, the city whose name we hear but we never come anywhere close to that in the lord of the rings even in the appendices we never really come to Enuminous, right um and so the game gets to imagine what would that have been like what would Arnor have looked like at its height, and therefore what would have survived? And the statue, this colossal statue of Elendil, is one of the favorite things, right? It's, um, um, notice how almost uncorrupted it is, right? It's almost completely intact. Who's going to loot that, <laughs> after all, right? Um, and so the idea of the image of Elendil still standing uh, as he is um, after all this time. Uh, is uh, a really neat symbol of uh, of Enuminous there. All right, well, we're going to end here uh, by the High King's Crossing, which, as I recall, is what this is called. Um, and uh, we will come back next time. So next time we may get to work towards the Old Forest, or I might come further north here into Evendim uh, and uh, work towards Enuminous. We'll keep exploring Evendim uh, when, we have, uh, when we have time in between stuff. But... Uh, Anyway, we'll see about that. So thanks, everybody, for joining me. Uh, really great uh, to be back with you guys again, and I look forward to having class next week, as usual, and getting back onto our regular routine. So thanks, everybody, for joining me, and I will see you guys next week. Bye now.